Great, thanks. Uh, well, thanks again to Pippa for the invitation to present today. Um, I am here on behalf of my co-authors, Mike Callan at UCLA, uh, Clark Gibson at UCSD, and Danielle Jung, uh, Princeton, going to Emory. Um, the project I'm going to present today is from um, an anti-fraud technology that we developed in Uganda. But I should say that it builds on a pilot study that I did with Mike Callan in Afghanistan in partnership with Democracy International, and Eric and Glenn are here. Um, and we have since replicated this and kind of changed the design and just ran it in Kenya's last election, which was a couple months ago. But I'll, I'll focus on Uganda uh, in this presentation today. So. As we all know, elections are now the primary means by, mo by, by which most citizens on Earth uh, you know, sort of yield leaders in some sort of another, regardless of how well those elections are managed. And over the last 25 years, uh, election observation has become sort of a standard occurrence around elections. So using both international and domestic observers now pretty much every election is observed in some form or another. There are very few elections that have no kind of observation at all. And a lot of the motivation of this study comes from sort of uh, what I would call the challenges uh, that exist in international and domestic election observation and trying to overcome those challenges. I think some of those challenges are challenges of theory, some of them are methodological challenges, and some of them are challenges of measurement. And so that's sort of uh, where our, our motivation comes from. Now, this is, a, this is from Uganda. This is a lot of people voting. And this is a picture of the EU observation mission in Uganda uh, for the 2011 election. Um, I think the first challenge that occurs with trying to estimate the effect of observers on fraud reduction or improving electoral practices is that it's very, very, very hard to get uh, election observation groups to agree to be randomized, OK? And where they have agreed to be randomized, it's very, very hard to get them to actually comply with randomization protocols. So I've been an international election observer in seven missions, and I've noted, I sort of classify two kinds of observers. There's the observers like me who want to go to the far-flung pl far places that we know have a lot of fraud. Okay, We want to go hunt for fraud like Sherlock and actually try to find it. That's the first kind of uh, observer. The second kind of observer is the kind that doesn't really want to go far at all, wants to kind of be near the nice hotel and get back by the pool for dinner or a drink or something like that. So they like to sort of be adjacent to where they're staying, and they're not necessarily as interested in going and, find, and actually finding the fraud. But in both cases, it would be very easy to predict where they're going to go, right? where international election observers are going to go. And it, it would therefore be easy to, to strategically readjust. But also, it makes it very, very hard to estimate the effect of observation on fraud if uh, there's biases associated with where people go and if they also don't comply. Um, now, that's with international observers. With domestic observers, domestic observers have, have much better coverage in terms of where they go. And domestic observers, I think, have actually been better at allowing academics like me to randomize and actually are better at compliance. Um, but there's a number of problems with domestic observation, too, which is that a lot of groups even though they try to sort of be free and fair and independent as possible. There's a lot of political interest and captured interest with domestic groups. Um, and so a lot of domestic groups are actually intensely political, usually on the side of the government, or parts of their organization could be, could be uh, vulnerable to elite capture. But also, even in the case where they're not, um, you know, I study Sub-Saharan Africa and Afghanistan. If you're sort of a an inner, if you're sort of a domestic monitor in a polling station where 90% of the the ballots legitimately go for a candidate, um, and let's say it comes in at 98% or 99%, there's lots of intimidation and coercion of observers in in those instances. And so I think it's very hard for observers, even if even if they're trying to be fair, to necessarily report on things that are going wrong on malfeasance. Um, Second is, and this gets to the theory of observation, it's not clear theoretically what observation should do. There's a diverse set of activities that international domestic observers actually engage in when they're at a polling station. So they may just be there to observe the count. They may be there just to see the opening of the polling center or the closing or just there during voting. So when I was with Eric and Glenn in Afghanistan, we only got about 15 minutes per polling station because of security concerns. There's a, some things you can do in 15 minutes, not a lot of things you can do in 15 minutes. Some of our observers stay there the whole day. Some are conducting PVTs. Some are there for just a couple minutes. There's just a whole range of activities that are wrapped up in observation. So then it's very hard to think about, well, which one of those activities should actually influence the process? And if so, how would we actually measure that? 
So it'd be hard to isolate like a very clean treatment there if they're actually doing 50 things in, in different time periods across uh, polling stations and across countries. And um, another problem is that there's no real precise outcome measures that observation groups use, right? So you, you get an observation report and you look for whether or not they call the election free and fair. That's sort of the tagline, right? But there isn't a systematic uh, collection of data that goes towards that judgment. And what I found recently with the Kenya election is that the international observation groups actually documented significant administrative failures in the election and then called it free and fair or called it credible. I don't even know what credible means, but um, it, there's no systematic gathering of data that leads to certain kinds of judgments over others. And, and so we sort of want to think about precise outcome measures that help us to sort of uh, assess the legitimacy of an election. And last, a personal concern of mine is thinking about ways to use really cheap and scalable technology to increase the universe of polling stations that we might be able to visit on election day. And I think regardless of how much we fund international or domestic groups, there's always going to be some limitation to where they're able to go. But citizens go to every polling station in a country. So why don't we think about ways to innovate in, in activating citizens and, and thinking of technology that could be used, that citizens could use on their own to monitor their own elections. So one thing we're, th we're thinking a lot about, and, and you see this here with the farmer and the phone, is you know, lots of citizens in poor countries, uh, you know, regardless of their situation, have cell phones. And how could we use cell phones to monitor elections and sort of scale monitoring beyond the traditional polling stations that international domestic observers visit? So what I'm going to do in the next slide is kind of describe what our intervention is. And then in the slide after that, I'm going to say how we measure our outcome. And then in the slide after that, I'm going to show you the results. So our intervention is the delivery of a letter to polling station managers on election day while people are voting. And what the letter does is it announces to that polling station manager that their polling center has been randomly selected to have the tally of that polling station result photographed the next day by our researchers. Okay? And that we will then compare the photographs of the tallies that are posted at that polling station with the result that's ultimately certified by the election commission. And we will take differences between those two vote counts as evidence of irregularities. Okay? In Afghanistan, we did one version of the letter that we were able to deliver to 471 polling stations, which is about 5% of the national total, um, in 19 provincial centers out of 34. In Uganda, we were able to do 1,000 polling stations um, uh, out of about 20,000, but it was nationwide coverage. And these are just with Ugandans that we've trained. Okay, So all they do is deliver this letter on election day. In Uganda, we added a diff two different versions of the letter. We, we did the randomized announcement version, and then we also did a version of the letter that reminded uh, Ugandan, the presiding officers, what the penalty for committing election fraud was. We're just cutting and pasting from Ugandan election law. I think it was something like up to a $5,000 fine and a year in prison. And then we have a third version of the letter that does the announcement of the monitoring in addition to reminding them of the penalties for committing fraud, okay? So this, the theoretical innovation here, I think, um, really comes from behavioral economics and the political economy of corruption, which is when you, when you um, change the probability of detection for illicit behavior and you announce that to people, you're more likely to get them to, to sort of behave better, okay? So what we're doing, is, it's not just that we're observing them, we're telling them that we're going to observe them, right? So it's the randomized announcement. Of, of monitoring is, is the treatment here. Now let me tell you how we, how we measure fraud then. What we do is, in Afghanistan we only had digital cameras, but in Uganda we used uh, HTC smartphones. We have a specific app designed that then our researchers go the next day, they enter in a polling station ID code uh, that corresponds to where, where they're supposed to be, and then they take photographs of the tallies that are posted there. So here, here's a tally. Uh, you can't see it very well because it's a bit in the dark, but this is a tally, uh, an example of a tally posted in Uganda. And it's now sort of international practice to post tallies at each station to kind of develop an independent account of what happened before the tally went up the chain of custody. It was finally um, adjudicated by, by the election commission at the national level. And then here are our researchers just training on how to take these photos of the tallies the next day. Um, in the next slide, I'm going to show you our results, and we're going to look at three different outcome measures. Um, one, we're just going to look at whether or not the tally was posted. And Ugandan officials by law have to post the tally. And in about 80% of our sample, the, the tally was never posted. 
that's a violation of the law. Second, we're going to look at an adjacent dig digit measure, so getting to forensic techniques, but looking at the propensity of the last two digits to be adjacent digits, meaning a 3 and a 4, or a 7 and an 8. Those should occur about 18% of the time if, if you were to do it randomly, and people think that humans have a propensity to sort of uh, have a disproportionate favor for using ad adjacent digits when they're coming up with numbers on their own. And then last, we're going to look at the vote share for uh, President Museveni, who was the incumbent president, very strong dominant party system, and whether or not he, he, we sort of view him as the candidate most likely to rig, whether or not there's an outcome um, on his vote share. Okay, so Fabrice is not the only one with regression results that are hard to read, but I will say... Uh, Mine so, were harder. Okay, so, so what we have in missing, uh, sorry, what we have in column one and column three is the missing measure, whether the tally was posted at all, and then in column two and four, we just have the adjacent digits. Now, the first thing, uh, and the first thing I want to point out is that if, if you... So if you look at the constant here for the missing, this is the amount of missingness in the controls, right? So in the control sample, so I should have said, Randomized control trial, 1,000 polling stations, and about two-thirds we have some sort of intervention in the letter, and then in one-third we don't deliver a letter at all, but we're taking photos in, in, in both the letter delivery and not, so we're looking at the effect of the, uh, the delivery of the letter. Um, but in the controls, we have 78% of the sample not posting their tallies, which is a clear violation of the law. Okay? But with the announcement of monitoring, we have a reduction of that of about 11 percentage points. Um, and then if we look at we look at the adjacent measure, we also see um, that in the sorry in the constant down here, it happens about 31 percent of the time, which is way beyond what you would think it would be if they were produced at random. And then we have a reduction of about eight percentage points uh, there as well, so reducing the propensity of adjacent digits. And the last thing I'll show is just on Museveni's vote total. In column five, we've included, uh, we haven't excluded any outliers, so this is the full sample here, and we don't see strong effects, but when we trim our outliers at the, at, at the top and bottom 5%, so these would be the places where Museveni either got nearly every vote or didn't get any votes at all, then we actually see, we see significant effects, which I think makes sense. So in the places where a candidate is either totally completely strong or totally completely weak, our intervention probably doesn't have much of an effect, but sort of the, in between, once you trim those outliers, we do start to see effects, which I think makes sense. Now, this this figure is is interesting, although I want to caution um, some interpretation on it. So, as I said, there were so many missing um, missing tallies in the sample, and actually, our treatment, our uh, delivery of the letter, increased the likelihood that the tallies were posted. Okay, but we're trying to rely on the difference in the photographs between you know, the photos of the tallies and the ultimate certification, but we've just now affected the propensity of the tally to be posted due to our treatment. So because our outcome measure correlates with our treatment, it's very, very hard to then kind of look at this as definitive results of anything, so we sort of urge caution on this. But this is for, um, this is for the sample where we do have the tallies posted, and what you see is the blue line is the original photograph um, for monitoring punishment in both, okay? And then the red line is the final, so this is our photograph is the blue line, and then the red line is the final count certified by the commission. There's two important things to see here. One is that in the comparison of the two photos, you know, each of the blue lines shows a reduction in votes for Museveni, okay? So almost of about 40 ballots right here, and 60 ballots here for both, okay? It's also the case that the treatment affected this at the, at the commission level as well, but less so, okay? So the treatment affected what the commission ultimately certified and they reduced votes for Museveni, but less than the original photographs that we have. And what we think this is is maybe evidence of a recovery strategy at the commission level to try to gain back some of the votes that were reduced from the photography. Okay? So we think this may actually be evidence of, of a recovery strategy. But again, this is a biased sample. We urge caution. We have done leboundings on this to sort of look at the full sample of what we think the full sample of the effects were, and we get consistent effects with this. But just, you know, again, we have to urge caution on interpretation of this result. Um, and I think I'm about out of time. So thanks.